Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today on the show, I'm pleased to introduce you to Francis Key. Francis is a former English as a second language teacher, a musician, a writer of plays and musicals, mother of four daughters, and grandmother to seven. When her mother passed away seven years ago, she had an extraordinary experience of communication with her mom that began 19 days after her transition. This communication continued intensely for several years, resulting in four books which contain 100 spiritual insights. Frances is a dual citizen of the United States and Australia and divides her time between Florida and New York, where her family members live. You can find out more about her on her beautiful website, which is www.theteambooks.com. A warm welcome to Frances Key. Welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so much. Thrilled to be here. Oh, thrilled to have you. I got to spend the morning on your YouTube page and website, and I'm just so intrigued. Oh, wow. How does your story begin? First of all, you're now currently in uh, New York, right? Yes. Physically? I'm here for a year. I'm mm-hmm. here for a year um, helping with grandchildren, going back and forth to the other family members in Florida, too. And uh, I found myself with uh, lots of uh, quality free time, and I'm really trying to be the best steward I can for the books, which, by the way, the full title is The Team, A Mother's Wisdom from the Other Side. Oh, beautiful. Um, books one, two, three, and four. Mm, congratulations yeah, on that. So I'm very happy to be able to speak um, about this beautiful material, which, by the way, I am uh, a student of. Not, uh, I consider myself a scribe of it and a student of it, and not the original author in oh. many, in any way, shape, or form. Yes. Um, when I read through it, I realize every time, um, you know, who wrote it, and uh, I'm not capable of uh, the the words that that poured through. Oh, They're really a gift. Beautiful. Well, how does your story begin? As a child, did you have any abilities or maybe give us a little bit about your past and what you went into mm-hmm. for work because you're up to so many things mm-hmm. and then maybe how yes. this all, the books came about. Okay. Um, yes, as a young child, um, my mother and I were extremely close. She was also a musician and teacher. And she recognized in me um, uh, a spiritual yearning, I guess you might say. And she really cultivated and listened. I would say more than anything, listened and supported my my thoughts, my writings. I started writing as a young child uh, poetry. And um, it was easy for her to see that my poems were... um, kind of reaching, reaching for God. So uh, she really worked with me on that. And she was in her own exploration uh, of spiritual matters. She, we were in the Catholic Church. And then when I was about five, she began to explore different places. We went to the Unitarian Church, where there was a lot of open-minded discussions um, that I was able to uh, be exposed to. And uh, one night, she took me to a group uh, that met at the Unitarian Church, and they were discussing automatic writing. And I was 10 years old at the time, and I said, oh, I do that. And my mother looked at me. She didn't even know what I... I said, when I write my poems, somebody helps me. Wow. So they, they immediately, they, they were adults, but they all said, well, can you show us? And I did. And um, there's only one sample of the automatic writing left that we managed to keep over the years, and it's um, a copy of it is in the book. It's in the books. So I wrote, and we became aware of uh, what was really going on. But as the years went by, I, I've heard this happens to a lot of people who have this kind of connection with the other side when they get into their teens, um, it, it, a conflict often sets up. 
you know, because you want to go into the real world and you have this pull back and forth of, you know, getting your, your hands in the clay, so to speak, and this other side that keeps pulling you. And also, I think it could be sort of the body goes through a hormonal change and it makes you even more sensitive. And I became afraid, to be honest, of all of it. Um, I had experiences where it was just too open and I couldn't make heads or tails of it sort of. So I kind of closed things off um, to a degree. And then in my 20s, well, actually, when I was 12, uh, my mother took me to a church called the Universal Church of Ontology, which was a metaphysical church. And in my 20s, I became very involved in spiritual writing for the church. And I felt very inspired when I would write for them. And I'm sure it was the same source, but I didn't think of it as automatic writing. So... Fast forward in my life, um, my mother and I left that church eventually, and we didn't really uh, connect with another church, but we continued our own spiritual conversations and um, awareness, the growth of awareness. She was definitely and is definitely my spiritual teacher. So uh, through the years, she would say to me, you know, Uh, you should do that automatic writing again. And I would say to her, Mother, you're getting older. She was in her 80s. I said, why don't you write a book? Oh, I don't want to review my life, she would say. And I said, it doesn't have to be that kind of book. Each chapter could be just a different topic of things you've learned through your life, your spiritual topics, you know. So she tried, and she said, I'm just too old. I just can't do it. So she would say, well, why aren't you doing that? inspirational automatic writing anymore and I'd say I don't know I I just don't know so eventually my mother became ill Um, I took care of her for 20 months she had cancer and um, when she passed away I was with her and other family members and I felt at her passing something I didn't understand until later I felt like a part of me left my body with her and a part of her entered my body. It was like an exchange of some kind. It was the most incredible, I don't want to call it a sensation, but it was like a knowing and something very quiet came in, into my being. Mm. And a few days later, I said to my sister, I said, you know, I feel like my nickname, by the name, by the way, is Frankie. And I said, I feel like all the frankiness in me has gone away and something else has replaced it. And she said, well, this must be part of grief. And she was concerned about me. And I, and, and I, <laughs> I didn't know how else to say it. You know, I know it sounded strange to other people. But a complete change came over me and came into my life. Um, And within 19 days, actually, my second daughter, who's named Autumn, called me and she said she was pregnant with her first child. And I was so excited for her and I got on a plane, this was 19 days after um, my mother's passing, to fly up to New York. I just had this impulse. I had to put my arms around her pregnant body. Hmm. And on the plane, the communication began with my mother. So I'll pause here because you might have a question. (laughs) I'm kind of rambling on and on. You can ramble because I'm just hanging on to every word. Like, how did... Yeah, just keep going. How how did it begin on the plane? um, Well, I'll back up just for a second about that. Um, Two weeks before my mother passed, Autumn had gone to her and hugged her in her her hospital bed, you know, hospice had put into the house and said, Nana, um, when you get to heaven, could you ask the angels to send me a baby? Because I haven't been able to get pregnant for a year 
Wow. And she said, in her beautiful Australian, lilting, lovely voice, she said, oh, I think I can help you with that, dear. Oh. Now, that was two weeks before my mother passed. And 19 days later, I'm on a plane and my daughter is pregnant. Beautiful. So immediately after my mother's passing, my daughter was pregnant. And so it really felt like uh, a blessing and that this child was connected to, was being sent. Sure. <laughs> the timing was yes. perfect. Yes. So as I flew there, I was looking out the window. And pardon me if I get choked up on this because it was so intense. It's really hard to remember. That's okay. Um, without feeling that way. Sure. but. It's okay. As I looked out the window at the clouds, you know how they are, so glorious when you're looking out from a plane. And I just thought to myself, oh, you know, the beauty of it. And I thought, Mother, is there any distance for you? What is it like for you? Is it because, because the clouds just were so vast, you know, and I just was thinking about distance. And I heard her voice answer me. And it was so clear, it was as if it were audible. It felt like it was in my head, but it also felt like it was audible. You know, I'm looking around like, where did that come from? And she said, well, it's not distance like you have. Not exactly like you have. It's more like I can drop into uh, a person's consciousness. And... uh and so, you know, I listened to that, and and then the, it just continued. She said, you know, look around you. Out of the, And then she talked about focus. She said, out of the corner of your eye, you can see someone's dress. And in front of you, you can see the pilot's door. And out the other corner of your eye, you see the, the clouds. And at any second, you can shift your focus to any of those things. Anything in this airplane, you can shift your focus to, and you're immediately tuned into that and tuning out the other things you're seeing. And she said, it's like that. I can tune in and drop in like somebody's Nate, like I drop into a neighborhood into somebody's consciousness. Well, as this, I always have a pencil and paper with me in my purse. It's just been my life um, as a writer. I, I always do. So I pulled it out and I started writing down what she was saying. And it went on for the good hour and a half flight. And I thought as I got off, at first the, the, the conversation, it was more about my life and about my feelings and about my love for her and my missing of her. And, you know, those kinds of things were our conversation. And then it became more universal. She was just talking to me about all of it. And she was really focusing on tools and awareness that, that can enrich our lives and make our existence here um, less confusing. So when I got off the plane, I thought, well, that was a one-time experience. I felt like it had been this amazing hour and a half of communication. But I got, and I got in the taxi and called someone uh, and told her about it. Because I said, I have to talk to you. I have to talk to somebody about this. Sure. And so we did. We discussed it. But then it never stopped. It went on for, well, several years. But the first, the first and in, most intense was about, the, about six months. It was an incredible, uplifting, energizing period of time. All pain left my body. I needed no sleep. I was energized and full of, uh, um, it was just like a course of electricity running through me at all times. I developed, every time I would communicate with her, I would experience this ecstatic feeling in my forehead, which I learned as time went by what people have described as a third eye. And it, it actually never stopped. I could feel it like slightly all the time. And then sometimes during commun more intense communication, it was, it, it was 
you know, overpowering, like could make me dizzy. Mm, so a piece of her um, really did enter you with her transition, sounds like. Yes, I have no doubt of it mm. because um, so many things changed. It was like a, an emotional healing of uh, lingering hurts and angers and things like that that had, you know, I had been carrying through my life, vanished, have never returned. Um, a peace and a knowing began that has never gone away. Now, I don't have that constant communication. I do sometimes experience it, and I sometimes experience the um, sensation in the forehead and meditation and things like that. But that's all right. I was taught through this whole experience not to cling. We are not to cling to certain feelings and experiences that we have in our spiritual journey. You know, we can become imbalanced and even addicted to the idea that we have to have, you know, we have to always see or feel or sense something. Sure, sure. And she pointed out, we are here to be on the earth and not to escape from it, but to bring in the light and merge it with this very natural existence. Um, and she really cautioned against, you know, wanting to get out of here <laughs> and using any of this, uh, of these tools that, that we often uh, pursue when we're seekers. We pursue meditation and, and watch a lot of videos on the subject or read a lot of books. Yes. But we have to stay balanced with it because we are here to bring the light to share the light, and we are all capable of, of assisting with the evolution of the entire planet, the spiritual evolution of the planet. Wow, Francis. When this first started happening in the airplane, did you st first start thinking you're talking to yourself? Or you know, you I probably would have thought that if, if I um, had never had an experience like this before. Mm, that's right. But I guess because I was aware of sort of my natural um, ability when I was younger to, to receive information mm -hmm. like that, and because I've had um, many experiences, what people would call psychic or mediumship, you know, through the years, I had no doubt that I would communicate somehow in some way with my mother after she passed because I had seen usually through dream visions um, and a few other more waking experiences. I had connected with a lot of people who had passed in my life. This was not new to me. However, this was new to me. Mm -hmm. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that I would have direct communication with my mother and that my life would be completely uh, transformed physically and emotionally and that these books would be produced? Oh. You know, I just assumed and hoped I would have a, a visitation and a sure. dream or something of that nature. Well, I think most people want that. In our last several episodes, we've been talking about uh getting in touch with our loved ones and practices to feel their energy and things like that. And uh, mm -hmm. to, to hear your experience, it's just like, it is all possible. And it sounds like as a child and with the automatic writing mm -hmm. and, and the poems you wrote, you were kind of being groomed for this, keeping the channel open. Uh, yes. It's magnificent. It really is. So there you are with um, probably tons of papers filled with, spiritual insights <laughs> at what point <laughs> they were handwritten yeah at what point did you say i've got to share these well in the very beginning the first book i released uh three weeks after she started talking to me that's fast because it was night and day it was night and day and i had this i, I was given this incredible level of energy to do it i mean i wasn't tired i would just 
night and day, stay right and right, sleep a little right and right. Um, I wasn't working right after she passed because I'd been taking care of her yes. full time. And that's all I did. So within, she died uh, October and 10th and then, no, October 9th. And then I released the book in January. So that was the first book. And I had thought at first of just releasing it as teachings my mother had given me in my life because I, I was, I hesitated. I mean, I hesitated to tell my own family members that I was actually talking to her. Mm -hmm. Sounds a little Uh, weird or could to some. Yes. And it, it took, they were very respectful and, and they know, they knew enough about me to know that I had that uh, tendency, if you would say, but they were concerned a little and they kept a close eye, I think, on how I was doing, but it became evident to them, particularly when they read the material, that, you know, these weren't the ravings of a, an imbalanced person by any means. So um, I decided Finally, I thought, you know, I'm going to release it and just say what happened. I'm going to tell tell the tell it in the book, which mm-hmm. I do. The, how how it all came to be, rather than say spiritual insights from my mother, you know, without saying when it occurred. Yes. Um, so I decided to go forward with it. I was, you know, a little nervous. Sure. Um, to go public like that, but I've never regretted it. I think it's exciting. So, I really do. Uh, really, is are there some of the insights that you can share with us? Oh, you know, it, they, <laughs> there's a hundred. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know there would be a hundred, but at the end, I counted a bump. I went, "Wow, one hundred! They are so unique." Um, after I after I had this experience and and started, you know really reading through the material because I pick it up today and I'll read it and I'm just blown away by it. Um, People started contacting me saying, Oh, have you ever heard of this NDE or have you heard of this or have you heard of that? Really? I hadn't seven years ago. I, I don't know. I just wasn't watching NDEs. I had heard of Raymond Moody because my mother had told me about him. Mm -hmm. When I was in my 20s or 30s, I guess she was reading the book because she was going, oh, this and that, because she was always sharing these things with me. But I just wasn't aware. And so people started saying, well, what about this and what about that? So I started comparing it and finding that some of these concepts, which I had never heard of, were out there in a different way. But then some of them, I truly, and others have told me, they've, they've never heard of. Um, but it's the power of the language. It's the way it's spoken. You know, I can talk about it, but I'm just a person talking about it. Mm-hmm. It is the way the words are woven together um, that are so unique and so different. I'm going to grab a book real quick here. Open to a and, random page. Um, I'll read page. you some of the titles, <laughs> yeah. and I'll let you know which ones I want to speak on. Just a second. Okay. To our listener now, this is kind of fun, isn't it? <laughs> I came to realize that in book one, the seed for everything in the rest of the books is there. Because as the other uh, information unfolded, um, I would look back and I'd think, oh, there's just one word or one sentence in book one that alludes to that. And here it is, an entire chapter developed. So book one really plants all the seeds and it's in a, it's written in a more simple style, and it's also written very much in my mother's voice. That's great. But I think what happened is once I became trusting and open to my mother's voice, after book one, and she said, there's book one, at the end of book one, she said, there's book one. 
put that out. I didn't know how many books there would be. When I began on book two, many other styles of writing came in. You have, uh, there's a chapter called uh, Your Mystical Body. And it's all about the human body relating to the universe. And it's written in a, in a very medical style. Then you have scientific sounding material. Then you have uh, poet, poetic material. So I came to realize that as she says, you are not alone. You are not even functioning as one person. Nobody is, for you are a member of a team, a spiritual team as close to you as breathing. And she goes on to develop the idea that we are each representative here of our team, and that the team learns collectively, shares the information collectively, even shares um, plans, karmas, um, intentions, missions, everything is collective. A team, a team, every teammate doesn't have to come and do everything on this earth because you learn vicariously through each other. And when you return to your team upon your transition and you report back to your team, you're like someone coming home from a big conference where you spoke on behalf of the team, but then you go back and you you brainstorm about what worked well at the conference and what, what needed more. And everyone learns from your experience without having to literally do everything themselves. So I became aware in book two of all these teammates that were actually directing the writing. And my mother does come in and out of all the books, but there are others. There are others as well. But in book one, um, for I pre- example, I the appreciate power, you the power sharing of- this. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but I just so appreciate you sharing these. Um, love oh, hearing. So, it. I'm so I'm so happy to do it. Oh. Um, she talks about uh, parallel vibrations, the hodgepodge that is the earth, human ingenuity, activating the alternatives. Reciprocal influences, extrapolation, um, elimination through illumination, the gold and silver of it all. The titles are unusual and the approach is unusual. Um, Spiritual invigorators. I'd like to just read a little bit because uh, really... There's something in the language that is so much more than what I can capture just mm-hmm. talking about yeah, that's it. that's fine. Okay. And I just okay. ordered your book on Kindle. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, while well, you went to um, get yours, I thought, I want this. And I just, I just want to... Uh, book one? Yeah. I just want to repeat okay. something that you said because it's on your website, which is theteambooks.com. Okay. You are not alone. You are not really even functioning as one person nobody is for you are a member of a spiritual team as close to you as breathing that just resonated with me gave me goosebumps and gosh we feel alone all the time and to get that our life is a bigger purpose and i love like we've gone to a conference and coming back to report in what worked what didn't work yes there's a whole new view um, of living it, it it is, and uh-huh. she, she talks about how uh, you know we are the boots on the ground, and then and they and those who are on the other side are those in the lookout tower, um, and that we are constantly sending information back and forth to each other, um, and then we switch places. I mean, it's really it, it's painful as it often can feel when someone passes. We really are just finishing our course here and and continuing there. And at times, we are more useful on the other side. You know, it's sort of like, I don't like to compare it to the military, to be honest, but it's sort of like being told, you need to leave. Don't ask questions. Mm-hmm. We have a mission here. Trust, you know, trust those in charge. 
and we need you on that side of the river um, to complete this. I don't have time to explain why. Just follow your orders. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, uh, read to us a little, if you would. I am. I'm looking okay. for the the right place, and I'm sorry. Maybe you want no. to edit a little part of my hesitation here. No, let's I really just didn't plan ahead. But um, this is the best way to do it. I think so because it is. Even though. It's a it's a conversation between you and I, and I always picture you, our listener, who's listening right now, sitting on the couch with us. And so it's natural; it doesn't have to be planned. And I think it's easier for okay. us to listen to just listen this way. But I'm excited. I'm going to read on uh, now. The the I'm going to read from the chapter called Openings, mm-hmm. October twenty eighth, two thousand ten. Uh, your book might be different. The page numbers. Okay because they sometimes lay out differently, but it is the chapter called Opening. And it, it begins with, you are not alone, which you just stated and I stated. And then she says, this was in the very beginning. I speak to your soul as your team member, to your heart as your mother, and to your mind as your teacher and friend. We are so fortunate to have so many layers of connection to each other, making this work so natural and simple for us. I want to tell you of where I am. It is a place that you will recognize from my description, for you have spent more time here than on earth. It is the familiar treehouse upon the mountaintop. A candle burns in the window there waiting for you. The universe is composed of everlasting bands of light, which are filled with countless points of consciousness with each band. Indeed, there is no end to the stretch of light in evolution. And all these components combine as the absolute, which is also called by the warm and familiar word, God. As one who stands upon a glorious mountain peak, wants to cry out with awe into the vastness, so am I bursting with a yearning to convey what it is I now can see. Yet I know that while these vast concepts are enthralling, the most useful concepts for you right now upon the earth are that of your spiritual connection to your team, how your physical body relates to your spiritual body, methods for accelerating your development, Tools to dispel negativity and the overriding mission of life on Earth. And I'm going to move over to page 17 because it talks about this uh, analogy of the conference. Okay. Thank you. I'm so happy right now. I'm so happy too. Yeah. And I have the book. <laughs> it's in the your... happiest I ever am is when I'm talking <laughs> about this material. Sure. Imagine a representative of a company being sent out to a conference. His head is full of facts and figures, concrete goals, and mile-high dreams. Some of them confidential, and some he is ready to make known. He has a mission to accomplish, and the hopes of a business are riding on him. His supervisors have prepared him. He has learned his lessons well. He has weaknesses, too which both he and the others are well aware of. Before and after the conference, he is in touch with the team. But when he stands up to deliver his material to the audience, it's up to him to be the strongest representative he can be, transmitting what he's been taught to the best of his ability. I'm skipping a bit over. Okay. After leaving the conference, he returns to his place of origin, filled with information about what was well-received and what was not, where he erred and where he excelled. And this information enables the team to regroup and plan anew. Just brilliant. This analogy, business or otherwise, reflects the basic structure of how souls unite into teams for a variety of missions in order that every member may grow and expand. It also reflects the fact that every member at some time or another bears the weight for the rest of their team, willingly accepting challenges 
that belong to the group. And the end of this is, I am here to tell you that you are valued, honored, and needed by your team. And I am here to tell you that by remembering who you are, the team to whom you belong, and the legacy that you carry within your spiritual DNA, you can transform your entire existence. Thank you, Mom. Yes. She says we have spiritual DNA, just like we have physical DNA. Mm -hmm. That the soul carries spiritual DNA. And certain people and experiences along the way serve to activate the DNA, the spiritual DNA in us. Just like a baby needs certain nourishment and experiences and exposure and movement and color and stimulation and so forth, a little child needs all that for their DNA to be activated their physical DNA, so they learn to crawl, they learn to walk, to speak. These things can be damaged and not activated if they're not exposed. So our spiritual DNA, um, we have very special events along the line that are planned for us and encounters that are planned for us to act for the purpose of this activ- activation. Sometimes we reject it. But they're there, you know, they're there. We can, mm-hmm. we can embrace them and allow the, the activation to occur. So great. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of many times similar things have happened in my life, and I just get like, oh, this is a lesson I'm supposed to learn here, <laughs> and it keeps showing up, you know, it might be mm-hmm. one of those things for me. This is just fantastic. Now, the team that mom is speaking with oh and speaking of and i also um it makes total sense to me that if it does sound like some of these spiritual insights and the other books are written by other people it makes sense that it would be the team of course yeah i do of course but it's so comforting francis for me in my seat right now to think it's not just me sandra champlain in this world that I've got this unseen team that I just happen mm-hmm. to be the, I'm thinking of a basketball court, you know, they're sitting on the sidelines mm-hmm. cheering me on, but I'm <laughs> the one on the court right now. Absolutely. Oh, that's really great. Would this compare? And your coach is there too. Oh, <laughs> your basketball coach is right there too. I got a big Several of them coach. Yes. running up and down with you. Think how a coach runs along the side of the basketball yes. court, yelling at you, watch out for this, look out, you know. A lot it's of times everywhere. people talk about guides. Could this be the same people, but just different terminology? You know, you I guess so. I guess so. People have asked me more specific questions about the team, like how many members are in my team? Or I, I, I don't know, you know, I don't. I haven't ever felt like I could pin it down. Right. I do know from the material that we have, everything is covered on our team. We have those who are excel in every area of life, engineers, mathematicians, you know, uh, different souls with different gifts who have come here, I should say, and perform certain works. We have teammates who are here on the earth with us, who are near us in our lives. And then we have some who are uh, here on the earth, but they're in another country and we've never met them, but their work is affecting us. Isn't that interesting? The the idea is we wake up in the morning with an inspiration or an idea. Mm -hmm. It's not stemming just from us. It is the compilation of uh, teammates here upon the earth who's who are doing particular works. Um, An invention may come up and you hear about people from four different countries. Somehow we're working on the same idea and they all came to partial conclusions and then they all met at a, at a scientific convention and they all put their ideas together. And now we have this new invention. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I mean, it physically happens like that. Yes. And it happens like that spiritually. And big spiritual events on the earth and big uh, social events on the earth are occurring through through teamwork. It's very exciting to me. It's exciting to me. I'm just thinking I had a great conversation with Wendy Zamet last night, who her and her husband, Victor Zamet, he's an attorney in Australia, who you may or may not know, but he has so much evidence of the afterlife and has really given his life to it. And they're part of a group called the Afterlife Research and Education Institute. And we were just talking about last night how we're all a part of this team pulling together stories and the people mm-hmm. to just move consciousness and mankind forward. And so, you know, mm-hmm. and you're part of the team and I, I feel really honored that I get to meet so many great people by virtue of Skype and telephone calls and record these to share them that we are part of a team and it's making such a difference, not only helping us through grief, but giving us life and really bringing that light, like you said, into our individual lives while we're here, enriching our lives. Yes, because, I mean... I know a lot of people feel they're just sort of stumbling along doing, you know, reacting rather than proacting in life. And I I went through many difficulties throughout my life, Um, emotional turmoil of all kinds, which ended with this experience. But there is, there is a sense of unity, belonging, power through feeling you have reinforcement by belonging to recognizing that you belong to a team. There's an understanding of those of our teammates who are on the other side, who can be more useful from that position. And there's an understanding of having reciprocal influences. That's a chapter in this book where we are told uh, that I want you to know you are bringing something very beautiful to the process. You are not only calling out for upliftment, not only reaching out with yearning and seeking to be useful and enlightened. You are making an offering. We are not only assisting you. You are also assisting us. Um, That chapter is a beautiful recognition that, We don't have to think of ourselves as down here in the darkness with our hands extended, you see, Mm -hmm. that we are all in the light and that you being in the state you're in now and I'm in the state that I'm in, New York, makes no difference whatsoever. The other side has no distance, just like you and I really have no distance. No. This phone links us. Our work links us, our energy, our thoughts, our vibrations, all the time are working together. It really is that way for them. She says, is the scout in the valley less important than those that scan the vista through binoculars from the mountaintops? Everyone's uh, contribution is, is vitally important. So she says, And so in the spirit of this message, I pour out to you our appreciation for your offerings, large and small, for your commitment to this mission and for your trust in all of us. I thank you for your willingness to hold me and all the team in a place of love and reverence in your mind. Never forget that what is being extended to you in return is just as certain. And they're not talking just to me. This is to everyone. Yes. We are not lost. We are not victims. We are not alone. We have everything we are doing and everything we will do is a contribution. And one thing that means so much to me when I feel tired or weary of it all, which happens to all of us, It says here in these books somewhere that whenever you feel that way, just remember that your effort 
is being absorbed by your entire team. That when you learn something, when you become enlightened, when you become aware, when you have an aha moment, when you make that special effort, when you're kind to someone, when you go out of your way to go that extra mile, when you take time to meditate, all those things are being absorbed by your team. So if you're too weary to do it for yourself, to me, it is just so meaningful to think I can do it for them. I love them so much. And by, you know, fulfilling that moment, it, it, it's something that energizes them. It's like food for them. It's like nourishment. It, it, I no longer am just working for my own self. That I guess that's the, the biggest difference for me this material has made. It's so empowering to just even play with this thought in my head that every step I take, every act of courage through fear, um, whatever, whatever it may be, that there's a team being impacted. And, you know, you mentioned we love our team. I cannot even imagine what it would feel like to really get how much they love us. Yes. Must be a huge amount of love. Wow. We really are one. Yeah. We really are one. Um, I'm looking at book four, and the name of book four is actually Beyond the Team. Hmm. Because it really expands... Uh, everything that it takes the lid off of, of all the, the insights from the other books. And it's so freeing, some of the concepts in here. Uh, in the beginning, it, it asks you to read, I think it's the first seven chapters before you go on to the rest, because it really can be a little complex if, without those basic concepts. There's a chapter called Strands of Possibility, which, uh, as I understand it, sounds a lot like quantum physics um, does today. There's a chapter called The Present Past, which hmm. is unbelievably uh, powerful to me and um, speaks about our present, the, the raising of our present vibration. Anytime you're in the, in the moment and you lift your vibration in that moment, uh, the effect is retroactive. It doesn't just go forward and create your next moment, your next experience, like most of us think. I'm creating my future with my present thought. It um, retroactively affects the past. And that's explained in detail in book four and as strange as it might sound at first it's simply that here everything is past present future moving forward on yes. this time line um, but in reality everything is stacked on top of each other so instead of that long straight line in front of you just visualize a line up and down and you can see how all events um, are impacted instantly. Like when you drop a pebble in the water, the ripples don't just go in one direction. They go in all directions. True. So everything we are thinking, feeling, being in this moment is affecting our past it's and our future. Pretty deep concepts, but I love it. This is, this is totally up my alley, Francis, these books. I love this. Mm hmm and I know I'm looking at the clock and we have to keep it rolling a little mm, bit just because okay. time's going by so fast. But you've given us a little taste of something I really want more of. And probably shame on me for going on to Amazon while we were talking because <laughs> I was listening. But I just like I had to have it and I had to have it now because it's just it, it really does sound like something that can enrich all of our lives. And I can get by spending this last hour with you how you speak and then how mom speaks and 
and I've heard enough uh, channeled and material that's come through inspired mm-hmm. that I, I've known that there's different people involved. <laughs> so thank yeah. you for that. Mm-hmm. I, I want to ask too, you were talk, you're, you had said um, in the bio you sent me that now that the fourth and final book is complete, you're planning to begin an online study group. Can you talk a little bit about mm-hmm. that? Yes. Um, well, Karen Swain, who you know, I believe. I do. Um, the Australian uh, lady. It, you know, my mother was Australian. I'm an Australian citizen and um, dual citizen. Uh, I have such a connection. And she directed me to connect with Australian uh, p- particular people online. It's quite remarkable. Karen being one. So uh, she and I have talked about the idea of, and some of her students are interested in a a book club where we will send, we're going to read book four. It's recommended very much that you read all the books because they really build upon each other. Uh, And, but book four, uh, there's quite a few people who have read the books and are interested in studying it. And we would simply read a chapter or two that week and then uh, come together online to study it. So anyone interested in doing that can email me at franciskey at gmail.com, and that's F-R-A-N-C-E-S, not I-S, E-S-K-E-Y, or they can write me through the theteambooks.com uh, website, and we will be getting that organized. Mm, I love it. I love your website, just the opening page with the the water mm-hmm. up against the sand on the beach I thought it's just beautiful beautiful I can thank my sister for that uh, thank you my sister. sister is the designer no, what's her yes. name your sister her first name Kelly thank you Kelly Kelly <laughs> <laughs> also I wanted to ask you your intuitive abilities still exist and I see on your website that you do readings could you tell us a little bit about that yes because that's pretty well powerful. that is something that I, uh, uh, I decided about four or five months ago to mm-hmm. begin. After after this occurred, it became evident to me that fear had blocked many things for many years for me. And after I trusted my mother's voice and the information and opened up fully to the whole team, uh, I began to have spontaneous, um, to do spontaneous readings for people. Um, just out of the blue, out, I could see someone on the street and all this information would begin to come in. So I, I, it wasn't at first something I really wanted to do publicly. I did it by word of mouth, quite a few readings for a lot for people who would just hear about it and contact me, friend to friend, things like that. But, um, I became aware that if I did it, I would be able to donate to a cause that was very dear to my mother's heart. She worked for years as a shelter mother for uh, teenage runaways and abused teens. And then she opened up her home as a shelter mother for sexually abused girls. She did that for three years at her home. After years of being a teacher and so forth already, she was in her 60s when she did this. That's extraordinary. So... Uh, I came upon, through a friend, an organization that um, I felt like I wanted to donate to. And so that is the purpose of those readings. It's intuitive reading. Sometimes it's mediumship. Quite often uh, it's mediumship, but not always. Sometimes it's simply a discussion with a person and um, of issues in their life or spiritual advice about their past. So it can take all kinds of shapes and forms, but I am thrilled to do intuitive readings for anyone who wishes to have them. Mm, I thank you for doing that, and you're reasonably priced. And after spending this time with you, I I would trust you. Just, I, And you never know if mom's going to come through or somebody on your team or a loved one. 
Um, mm-hmm. But I thank yeah. you. And just to remind our listeners, I know I've said it before, but Francis's website is theteambooks.com. And the team books are the team, a mother's wisdom from the other side. She's got three volumes that say that. And the other one is beyond the team. So there's four books and you can find them all on her website and there's links to purchase them and, um, and how to get in touch with Francis. But is there anything else you want to share before we end the episode? I know there's 99 more insights you could share, but we won't get into those. (laughs) (sighs) Ah. I feel like, I guess because we're talking about the readings, I feel like um, some of the listeners, I just really want to encourage um, the listeners that in spite of what you think because of some of your pain over over the loss of your loved one. There is a very special mission for you and you will do it in partnership, in holy partnership with that loved one. And by opening yourself to what that possibility is, you will draw closer to the one that you feel so distance from I just felt like that should be spoken Mm. for someone or or more than one person listening yeah I think one of the things that brings the community together here of listeners is we are people that have lost even though we haven't really lost them but they are no longer in the flesh with us and so looking for answers and that is so encouraging uh, even for myself to know my dad is my partner in everything I do and as yes. your mom is yours and the team. So I really want to thank you, Francis, for taking the time to be with us today. Anytime. It was such a pleasure. Oh, I love it. And I'm really excited to sink my teeth into your books. Really excited about that. And for our listener, I want to thank you for spending this past hour with Francis Key and me. And again, her website is theteambooks.com. And as a reminder, And maybe this is the first time you're listening, so thank you for being here. But there's a grand afterlife symposium in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, September 14th through 16th, 2018. We have it yearly. And there's so much cutting-edge information going on about the world of the afterlife and communications. And even if you can't join us in person, check out who some of the speakers are. And simply go to afterlifesymposium.org to find out. And our website, our home base is we don't die radio.com. I invite listeners to, if you're on Facebook, just type in we don't die listeners. And it's a small community. Well, not that small. It's over 3000 people now, but the people that support each other through grief, through life, through believing in the afterlife. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I'm always happy to be your host on we don't die radio. Believe you me, I get as much out of these episodes as you do. And I love that. So I do believe that our life is an education for our souls and our lives here on earth are important and just think of that team that is surrounds you now cheering you on through everything you're doing and um, let's all make them a part of our day and remember that so i really want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon mm-hmm.